Hi, y'all. My name is Alex Huff. I'm a fourth year graduate student with Phil Christensen, and I'm delighted to introduce today's colloquium speaker, Jim Skinner. He comes to us originally from North Carolina, where he got his bachelor's in geology from North Carolina State University, after which he worked for about five years in industry before returning for his uh, graduate degree at Northern Arizona University. This is where he started to work with Dr. Ken Tanaka at the USGS Astrogeology Science Center as part of the USGS NASA Planetary Geologic Mapping Program. Um, for the past 10 years, he's been the uh, map coordinator for that program. And that's where I met him in 2014 as a young junior undergrad geology major, uh, looking at the moon for the first time. And he's been a great mentor to me for the past seven years. And his uh, research spans the northern plains of Mars, space and geology, and most recently, implementation and process of mapping in relation to human exploration. His mapping expertise is internationally acknowledged, and he has a unique vision for this next generation of planetary research and human exploration. So with that said, his talk today is how geologic maps facilitate the exploration of worlds beyond our own. Please enjoy. OK, um, everybody hear me OK? Great. Well, thank you, Alex. It's um, interesting to be old enough to have somebody that you've mentored and come up and introduce you. So I appreciate that. Um, and thank you all for being here today, um, people who are in person and, and online as well. But I'm happy to come down here from Flagstaff. Um, we're supposed to get some snow tonight. And so I'll try to make it back up there as, as quickly as possible. But it's nice and balmy down here. And I appreciate that. So thanks for being here. Um, as Alex said, I, I am the map coordinator for the Planetary Geologic Mapping Program, and our job is to make the geologic maps, the standardized geologic maps, um, for consumption by the public, as well as for researchers, for every solid surface body in the solar system other than, um, other than Earth. Um, that's what we do at um, Astrogeology. So one of the things that I'll cover through this as well is that you know, USGS is not the only entity that makes geologic maps. There are other places, and those are equally as good as well. And we'll talk about the differences therein. Um, so, hope we have some questions. I think I'll get done in about 45 minutes or so, and happy to entertain any questions after that. So, we'll go through a little bit of introduction, um, talk about the fundamentals of geologic maps. And I'm not trying to insult anybody about this, but I just want to get um, a baseline understanding about what we're talking about when we mean geologic maps. We'll talk about the renaissance that we're going through right now with the amount of information that we have, um, this diversity of data sets, and those data sets come in a diversity of resolutions for a diversity of bodies. So uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when the folks started doing this for uh, the lunar surface um, in earnest, there were a handful of data sets, and now we are just inundated with data, and it takes a special approach to be able to parse those out and understand what we are coming up with as far as geologic units. We'll talk a little bit about geologic mapping, planetary geologic mapping for the past, present, and future. Talk a little bit about workforce planning and what that means for the university level, as well as um, people training and becoming um, the next generation of geologists, and what that means for planetary geologic mapping and geologic mapping in general, and then a few parting words. So let's start with the introduction. Um, Alex said that I worked in industry for a while, and I did. It was very interesting and entertaining. I did two different things. I worked offshore. Um, gathering some deep marine seismic surveys in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and a few different things have come up as I've been doing this for the past 20 odd years now, which is crazy to think about. Um, but in general, so we, we strung out um, seismic lines. It was deep marine surveys. We were out there for six to eight weeks at a time. Um, and when everything was going right and the data was coming in, it was great. When everything was going wrong, it was a lot of work. We were pulling cable in from the backside of the boat, changing things out, and it was a lot of physical labor. But we were doing two things when we were out there. We were gathering um, navigation data, really, really tight and accurate navigation data. And we were also gathering seismic data, very, very accurate and important seismic data that was worth a ton of money because it was indicating where the hydrocarbon uh, resources were. And one thing that occurred to me was that you can have the best seismic data in the world. And if you don't know where it is, it doesn't matter. Um, you can also have the best navigation data in the world. And if you don't have anything to go with it, it doesn't matter. So these two things play off of each other and we need context. That's one thing that I've learned moving forward. The second thing, the second thing is, is that I live in Flagstaff. It gets cold there. Apparently, when I came out from North Carolina, I was not aware of that, and it gets really cold. Um, one day, a, a few years ago, it got down to negative 18. I got up in the morning, um, went to go brush my teeth, turned the faucet on, and nothing came out. And it took me literally a few seconds to sit there and try to understand what was going on because nothing was coming out of this thing that I rely on. 
So it was broken. I went underneath the house after that and it was just spraying hot water everywhere and it's like panic attacks, all that kind of thing. But the point there is that infrastructure is there all the time. The things that we use all the time and rely on that we don't even understand, we don't know that they're there until they're not there anymore. And that was a lesson for me about reliability and the reliability of infrastructure. And the last thing is what I mentioned before, we're in this era of big data, a lot of data, a lot of resolution and big diversity. Um, you can have data and data is not knowledge, right? You have to interpret that data and transfer that um, data to observations, to knowledge and knowledge into wisdom. So if you don't have a good reason to analyze that data, it's just data. And so you have to have a purpose. So between context, reliability and purpose, those three things come together to make geologic maps. So a couple of things I want to dispel some myths. We've done this before. Um, I want to make sure that everybody understands that geologic maps are not the USGS and the USGS are not geologic maps. OK, um, we make geologic maps, but other, pe other people make geologic maps as well. We're not the only ones that do this. We're not trying to corner the market on it. Our products do certain things and other products do um, equivalent and complementary things. And we'll talk about a little bit of what that means. Um, geologic maps are not perfect. Right. And so we there are three different versions of the global geologic map of Mars, one based on Mariner data, one based on Viking data and one based on post Viking data and an amalgamation of lots of different data sets. All three of those maps are not right. One doesn't supplant the other one. They're snapshots in time of what is going on. And that's a really important thing for us to consider and keep in mind, because those maps are still relevant when we go back. The Viking maps in particular are really good and they're doing certain things and we need to understand what those are for Mars. USGS products are not so much better than other products that are out there. They're different and they do different things. And we intend for that to be the case. And we also expect the community to be able to publish geologic maps in different venues that complement those standard products. This is a good one. New data does not equal a new geologic map. First of all, it's data and the data is not a geologic map, but also you can have new data and you can make the best map in the world for an area that's already been mapped but it might not do anything new. So it's a clean, good looking, wonderful map, but it didn't do anything new and there's no point, right? And so we have to have a purpose to drive us to complete a new geologic map. Um, maps are intricate and they're complicated. Um, maps are required, so, but there is a shift in how they are prepared. Um, geologic mapping is both a process and a learned scientific discipline. And that creates a product and establishes and or refines a geologic context and facilitates future research. That part is really important. OK, it's a discipline. It's something that is learned. Um, it is we can train geologic mapping and we do. And when we take people out in the field, they understand and everything comes together. It's no different than any other scientific discipline. It's both a discipline and a process and a product. OK, um, a couple of fundamentals, again, not insulting anybody's intelligence here. A geologic map, and you can define this however you want to define it. Alex already poo-pooed my slide, and she wants to define it a different way, and that's fine. Um, a chart that displays bulk geologic observations, okay, of underlined observations intended to visually convey the formative history of a particular area and add context. So observations to context. What's important about these products is that you have to identify things that are consistently recognizable and traceable across a landscape. You have to describe them thoroughly and objectively. Objectivity is key in any geologic map. I don't care if it's something that's published in the JGR or something that's published by the USGS or the Journal of Maps. Objectivity is key. It must be repeatable. Objectivity leads to repeatability, and it has to minimally consist of the map itself, a symbol key or an explanation map symbols, a description of map units, and a correlation of map units. Some people think that the map itself is the product. It's not. The map consists of the map, the key, the description and the correlation. And those four things can uh, create the map. We get this a lot too. It's like, how do you do this? If you can't ever go there and touch it or lick it, geologists love to lick rocks and that sort of thing or bang on things. And if you can't do that, can you make a geologic map? And the answer is yes, absolutely you can. The alternative is to not do anything at all. And we're not gonna do that, okay? Um, you would never send somebody out into the field and not have a preparatory knowledge about where they're going, any kind of map, how to get there, safety, how to come back, all that kind of thing. This is the context that we operate in and we will make these maps. So there is equivalency uh, between terrestrial and non-terrestrial maps, but there are certainly caveats as well. For example, planetary geologic maps are typically more descriptive and less interpretive. We can't say with certainty at certain scales that something is a olivine-rich basalt. 
Okay. We can get some composition and we can allude to that and we can uh, interpret those kinds of things. We can't say something is a sandstone even. And so we have to be very particular about how we describe things. And then we have to be very particular about how we interpret things. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, interpretations for uh, non-terrestrial geology maps must be hedged and alternatives have to be provided to make it useful based on the state of knowledge as it exists right now. We go back and look at the Viking base maps for Mars before we had a bunch of post-Viking data. They still hold up because they were being objective about what they're describing. The interpretations have certainly changed and that's okay too. We expect that kind of thing. We don't wanna put a, a nail on something and have that map be the end all be all. We can't know everything without contact, right? So we have to be able to go up to those rocks and see them before we can really assert our interpretation. We can get down that road of interpretation but it has to be linked to observations and you can't say everything that you might want to say. You might know in your heart what it is, um, just based on all these um, different observations, the shape of the landforms that it's coming from, but we don't know some of these things. There's a philosophical question that's going on now about how much can we say a lava flow? We know it's a lava flow that's coming from an event. That's what, at least what we think. It's very fluid. It's very dark. It has these certain compositions that we can tell from uh, remote data sets. Can we call it a basalt? Or can we not call it a basalt? And I'm not going to give you the answer to that. I certainly go back and forth. The more you have an understanding about what it is, sure, say it's a basalt. We understand those things. At some point, we have to jump in as the experienced geologist and be able to assert some kind of interpretation. But we have to be careful about how we do that. We can, however, strategically blend data to convey some observations. Um, scientific, technical, and cartographic interplay. We need to be able to understand what we're looking at as geologists integrate all those things together, looking at the full range of data sets and the observations that play into the geologic processes that we think we're seeing. Um, data and data management is affording a greater interpretation. As I've said before, a recurring theme is we have a ton of data. We need to be able to um, manage it in, in a, a good way so that we can get the information out of it that we need. So terrestrial versus non-terrestrial and then standardized versus non-standardized maps. Standardized maps are those maps that strictly implement cartographic rules versus those that do not. That doesn't mean that one is better than the other one. I actually should have put standardized maps underneath the non-standardized maps to give the impression that we don't think one is better than the other one. They do two different things. Standardized maps are reviewed and published via a geological survey, whether that's a state geological survey or a federal geological survey or another country's geological survey, it doesn't matter. Typically they have standards that are put into place and checked. It's consistent, it has a controlled base, it has a controlled scale, symbols and styles. Symbols are really important. There's a whole book full of standard symbols that need to be used so that when I prepare a map and use those symbols, other people can see those symbols and understand what it means. It seems really basic, seems really simple. It's really difficult to do and to get people to think about it in a way that's standard. It's a low response to a data curve. So we have to prepare these maps. It takes years sometimes, and we do the best that we can as a community to review these products, get them right, and send them out. Um, observations typically outweigh the interpretations, and that's intentional. Non-standardized maps, however, you can review and publish via scientific journals. Um, we're starting to get to a place with the USGS where we can publish them as open file reports, which is kind of a snapshot in time of any one map project that you're working on. Um, they can be data releases, they can be just different kinds of things. Because of that, um, there's a high response to the data curve. As you get information in, you can quickly process it and turn around and say, this is a snapshot as we understand it right now. You can have a variable base. You can have a different intent. It can be thematic. You can even employ or develop or test out new symbologies. That's a good thing. It's versatile and it's flexible. Um, observations are typically less than the interpretations. Here is a place for you to put your interpretations into a document. These two things are not at odds with each other. They have to be compatible and they are compatible. We often, when we're publishing geologic maps, we ask the authors to strip out certain information because they want to cram as much information as possible into the geologic map text. And we want them to separate that out, put in a separate journal article so that they can reference each other. And that way there's two publications and they've taken out a lot of the over-interpretive things and just stuck with the observations. They don't like that recommendation, I understand that. But if we can get to a place where we're kind of moving forward with these two different independent documents, we're in a good place. Okay, so are they at odds? I mean, we have this kind of apples and oranges thing, which I hate the comparison of apples and oranges, and here I'm gonna use it anyway. But we have Granny Smiths, Brayburns, Golden Delicious, and Fuji's. Fuji's my preference here. Terrestrial, non-terrestrial, standardized, and non-standardized. And then I've also indicated that this is just with one data set. 
right? You can do this with one data set, and then all of a sudden you have multiple data sets and multiple resolutions. So immediately we have a cube of information that we're trying to leverage. There's no one right way to do this. There are better paths to do it, but you need to recognize what the purpose of this is, what your strengths are as far as the data sets that you're trying to provide, and who the audience is, who are the stakeholders. Okay, geo-renaissance. Right now we have a ton of, of um, just a fleet of spacecraft that are out there gathering excellent information for us to understand more about the Earth we live on, as well as the solar system that we exist in. Um, we are looking at many bodies in the solar system. We have a good understanding about the solid surface bodies, as well as some of the icy satellites and, and gas giants. There's a lot of things that are going on on multiple surfaces. We have plans to send people back to the moon, and hopefully we'll be um, looking at that um, this month and next month and moving forward. So in the next few years, the plan is right now to stick two people back on the moon. We need to do that as safely as possible. It's an exciting time to be um, a member of this community. It's an exciting time to be a geologist, and especially somebody who's a planetary geologist that's getting all this information. When I started at the USGS, um, Mars Global Surveyor had just started to fly and bring back data. And I remember working with Ken, I think that he gave me this exercise to see if I would leave or not, and I stuck around, but he wanted me to take laser shot points and average them up in a grid with a calculator and then extrapolate between those. I was basically making gridded DEMs, um, and it took me two weeks or so, and he just kind of was sitting there laughing at me, and I was just was like, okay, yeah, the elevation of this one point is minus 4377, this one's 4378, and I'll draw contours in between it. Later on, he told me that was just a way to kind of check it out and see if I was going to stick around. And I stuck around because I enjoyed it, but it was an interesting time because all of a sudden there was a flood of information. There was a flood of new data. We were getting really high resolution pictures of, of the Martian surface, um, and we could see compositional information that we'd never seen before. It was an amazing time to be there. And this is continuing. It's, sometimes it's almost, um, we have to step back sometimes and see how much we actually have and how much data there is out there. We're swimming in data. Okay, so the kinds of spacecraft data that we have, this is not even a complete survey at all. This is just saying, look at the kooky kinds of data that we have, it's great. We have lots of different things to merge together and glean information. Gamma ray and neutron spectrometer data, um, SAR data is giving us a, a really good information about um, different bodies and the characteristics of those bodies. We have um, visible wavelength, obviously, we got thermal data, we have carbon bearing gaseous data from atmosphere, detailed user altimetry. You guys hear me? Okay. Um, Spatial resolution. So we have a, a range of data, and then we have spatial resolutions that go on with that range of data. That's from submeter to kilometer, and then derivative information that is tens of centimeters. We're looking at data um, with high rise that is you know, a quarter of a meter or so, so you know, less than the size of this desk on the surface of Mars, which is pretty amazing. We can track rock falls. Uh, we can uh, do investigations about. Um, avalanches on the polar ice caps. Uh, we have a ton of information. The moon is the same way, and this is going to be really uh, great for us moving forward because now we're talking about safety concerns and hazards as people migrate across the surface for the first time in 50 years or so. That's what we have now. This is where we came from, okay? Geologic maps used to be made on airbrush bases, and so they would take um, images and they, so on the left-hand side there, and up at the survey, um, they would airbrush these and make the bases. They were artistic, and so um, sometimes you would be missing things because of the artist's rendition of what they were seeing. Those are the bases that were made. Those are the first iterations of the materials that we had. When they made geologic maps, they would have sticky, like paper, that would be red, and so they would cut out the shape of the, um, the unit and they would stick it on there and then they would cut out a compatible piece. It's like a little puzzle piece thing. And I can't even imagine doing that. So this is way before, you know, word processing and Illustrator and all those kinds of things. I can't imagine doing that and how time consuming and if somebody comes back and says, hey, you need to change this and just how aggravating that would be. But this is where it started. They didn't know the difference and it was a ton of data. So we've come a long way with data management. It started this way and now we're at this place. We have a ton of data, all different kinds. We have the GIS software to put it all together and look at it in layers and not just look at it. So GIS does a really good job of making a map, a geologic map or whatever kind of map you want. What it's really intended to do is to combine everything so that you can see this information in multiple kind of dimensions and we can see things through time. We can do correlations across all these layers of information. 
Um, it's a truly a tremendous way for us to start looking at all this data aside from a geologic map room. And then we have data portals. So the data, the software with which to analyze it, and a tremendous amount of um, software and data portals so that we can get a hold of this data. So when I think about planetary science, you know, I'm a geologist. My background is in geology. Um, my degree was in geology and marine and coastal resources. Um, and then my uh, graduate degree is in is geology straight up. I'm a certified and licensed geologist in the state of North Carolina. Um, it doesn't make any difference for me now. But when I think about those things, I think about geology and then planetary science. And planetary science is so much more than just geology. And that's a good thing. It has geology and geography in there, math and engineering, physics, astronomy. It's got everything, computer science. And those of us that are planetary geologists and planetary scientists are expected to know little bits of all these things. That's kind of the way of the world these days. So even if you're doing field work um, as a geologist on the earth, you're gonna go out and you're expected to know different kinds of data sets, how to manipulate things. And so there's an expectation in this modern world that we need to be able to manipulate and get access to the data. But it's an order of magnitude more for people that are planetary science, because all of our data is in this kind of um, digital realm. So we have a more nuanced view, an evolving view of the geology of the solar system, not just on one body, but on multiple bodies. We can understand what those bodies are, um, and we can start to compare across these bodies at different scales. We can see which data sets are the most meaningful on different bodies. We can see which scales and what kind of geologic processes are happening at multiple scales. A lot of this is being accomplished through geologic mapping. I said this before at an LPSC um, presentation a while ago is that a lot of us make geologic maps, okay? You don't have to be a mapping geologist or a geologist or work of the survey to make a geologic map. There's been plenty of times where a couple of buddies have been drinking beers or coffee and sketched on the back of a napkin. It's like, I saw this thing and then I saw this other thing over here about something on Mars or the moon. And you just made some kind of geologic map. And so everybody is a mapper in some sense. It's just a matter of how much you take it down that road. We need that context and we strive for it. Apollo 11 observations are now being put into a broader context. It's really cool. The local observations that we have, we can extrapolate now from a one-to-one -one kind of observational scenario. Mars history of liquid water, deltas and lakes, lots of different information there. And then we're even getting way far out into the, the solar system. Look at Charon's equatorial tectonic belt and subsurface water and everything that, that means with the, um, the icy bodies. So it's a really interesting time for us to be out there and looking at this nuanced view of the solar system. Since we've been observing um, kind of in this Apollo and post-Apollo world, the USGS has been there making geologic maps. And again, we're not the only ones. And I'll talk about it in a second about how we don't even know how many other geologic maps exist because it's really hard to search for them. USGS as a federal entity is required to make this data available. And so we track usage and where these maps are and that kind of thing. Starting with Shoemaker in 1960 and a one to one million scale map um, of the moon, and then Mason and Hackman 61, a one to actually four million scale map of the near side of the moon. We now have geologic maps of most solid surface bodies in the solar system. And a lot of these are from the USGS or working in coordination with the USGS. In my opinion, and I'm completely biased about this and I'll be the first one to state it. I think that a geologic map is one of, not the most, but one of the most critical unifying platforms that supports planetary science and exploration. And it's that way because it is combining so many different elements of the things that we observe. We need to place those things into context. We deal with maps. We as a society deal with maps more now than we ever have before. Everybody in this room probably has looked at their phone at some point today for a map, whether to get coffee or whether to check traffic or whether to see exactly where you need to go. Everybody has probably looked at their phone for a map. So we are integrated with maps these days. Those maps are for context and that is needed. It's a good thing for us, it creates efficiencies. Um, geologic mapping is the same way. It's not supposed to be pretentious. It's not supposed to be something that is holistic or the end of everything. It's supposed to amalgamate everything together as a rallying point for people to make their observations. So in my opinion, I feel like you know, geologic maps are those things that can bring everybody together and we can move forward with exploration. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the past, present and future. So Again, going back to the USGS, I want to point out too is that here's Gene Shoemaker um, doing this thing over the USGS in the 1960s. Um, the USGS Astrogeology Science Center was founded because of Gene and his cohorts who were trying to help humans get to the moon. That was a political endeavor, right? And that was not driven by science. 
that, but they're going there as a political endeavor in a race. And while they're there, they might as well be doing something. So Gene and his cohort started beating on the doors in Congress to try to get um, some funding to establish some kind of science campaigns. In my bag over here, I have that original copy of that science campaign that they proposed. And it's really interesting to watch them go back, to go back and watch them try to argue for this thing. One of the things that they did arguing for it was geologic maps. Um, and it's because of the context that established. You can't send them somewhere, those people on the moon, without some kind of map, hazard map, illumination map, um, you know, where the samples are gonna be, a traverse map. And so they argued from that point of view. And then the second thing that they did was they started arguing for training those pilots. They were all pilots, training the pilots to become geologists. So USGS was one of the entities, and there were lots of people that went through and around the USGS, but that was a rally point along with uh, Johnson Space Center. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about our counterparts um, in the Soviet uh, Union that were doing the same kind of thing at the same time. There was a lot of excellent research that was being done and it has since come out, but there were parallel efforts to get people to the moon and there was science that went behind the Soviet endeavor as well. So supporting the US space program, we're gonna go, what are we gonna do? Science and technical aspects of Apollo were something that they wanted to address. Geologic mapping was key. It wasn't the only thing, but it was certainly a part to put that context around it. Landing site characterization. How do we know where to go if we don't make some kind of map? Uh, and then astronaut training, geology and field techniques, and how do you train for this? It's said that every astronaut that went to the moon had a master's level understanding of the geology. Um, and that's because they did their work from field-based and remote-based geologic mapping in and around Arizona. Um, can you apply? It was not known until we went there and, and Gene and his cohort started looking at it. It's like, can you apply terrestrial geologic mapping concepts to other bodies? Um, it seems, you know, kind of a one-to-one, -one, but as they backed up and started looking at it, you know, we have remote observations. We can't go lick it, right? We can't go bang on it. We have limited data sets. We have topography and understanding about shadows. Um, what are we describing? In what detail do we need to describe that? How do we infer 3D, uh, 3D architectures? Um, terrestrial outcrops arise from the fact that we have mobile plates, tectonism, and things that are being uplifted, and then we have erosion. So we have this rock cycle that's really well exposed on this body. It's not so well exposed on other bodies, including the moon. And so can we do anything when we get there? Um, how similar are the geologic processes? There was real concern when Apollo flew that we would not be able to land, that the, um, the, the surface would not support the lander and that there might be danger for both the lander and the crew in the lander as they landed and started to rove across the surface. Um, Shoemaker et al. addressed these questions and the concepts of remote-based planetary geologic mapping works because it's primarily based on observation. Okay? Um, all the Apollo astronauts learned geology through mapping the field and remotely. So here's a little exercise. I think Don Wilhelms, if you guys haven't read any of his stuff, um, pretty dry. I mean, it gets into kind of geologic techniques and things, but he has a wit about him and he didn't pull any punches about how they made geologic maps. He was a person at the USGS that was in charge of making all the quad based maps. There's a systematic kind of framework that they chose different um, areas of the moon to make these geologic maps. And he was in charge of that. And he wrote a really excellent paper that talked about how that went right, how that went wrong and what they would go back and do differently. One of the examples was this um, to show just how you do geologic mapping in a very basic sense is cross-cutting relationships, right? And so the Lyle crater, Theophantus crater, and then there's one, two, three, four, five, and that's just showing the sequencing of all of these events that are happening on the moon. There's no scale bar on that image of the moon. And the point there is that it doesn't really matter. We're looking at sequencing at this point. What he wanted to do was to ensure that we're not just looking at landforms and drawing lines around things that are equivalent landforms. We are making sure that the landforms that we are um, identifying, because it is geomorphology based, but we're trying to take those landforms and extrapolate them into the subsurface. And so here you see that same sequence. And if you see in the middle there, you have this kind of massif that's sticking up. And here he has that drawn into the subsurface where you have this massive um, kind of older material and everything else is sitting on top of it. From a very basic sense, you see that this thing is the oldest, it's poking up and everything else is sitting around it. And you have impact craters and different things that are happening. So we can get a basic sequence out from one scene and that alone is important in geologic context because it gives us a time constraint. So I love this quote. Um, I quote this Donna Wilhelm stuff quite a bit just because I think it's, um, it's pretty interesting and it's very telling. 
This is from the near side geologic map of the moon. That was an amalgamation of the one to one million scale geologic maps of the moon. And Wilhelms and Macaulay said, the goal here is not to portray units that are just similar appearing surfaces or collections of similar topographic forms, but three dimensional bodies of finite horizontal and vertical extent. These are the building blocks of the crust of any body that you're looking at. So super important. We're not just drawing lines around similar. And when you do geologic mapping, you're not just saying this is knobby and this is smooth. You're trying to say, this is knobby. What are the reasons from a geologic eye that those might be? And how does that sit in three dimensions with other things? That's what a map is supposed to do. And if a map is not doing that, or the author is not preparing the map in that way, then they're not doing their job. The best maps, according to Wilhelms, the best maps that have been produced by experienced or by experienced field geologists who understand the purpose, strengths, and limitations of those maps. So to do mapping on another body, you need to understand what you're mapping on this body and be able to go out and touch and understand how those things are positioned in space. Why are we doing this, he is asking. Well, many things can be, cannot be learned on the ground, right? Given any less than extravagant expense of resources and time, meaning that it's really super expensive and it's really super dangerous to go to the lunar surface. And so that's the extravagant expense of resources and time. But they can be learned from photographs to a considerable extent. The point here is that this is context. You can have observations in a very local area. And if you understand the geologic context, you can put those samples with those bodies of three-dimensional rock and sediment and extrapolate those out to other areas. This is what is going on right now on Mars. Um, this is a, the effort that is being expended to try to get samples back so that we have an understanding of what those samples look like on that body and we can extrapolate further out. Oop. Besides being important, this knowledge of the planet-wide framework, framework is essential for determining the setting of the tiny spot samples examined or collected on the surface. Um, I enjoy looking at and zooming around um, on Mars and looking at all these different um, pieces of data. High rise is really super local and some really interesting things can be seen. You can see columnar joints from volcanic rocks. That's an amazing thing, kind of like Giant's Causeway, right? And so you can see these things, but then as you zoom out, it is so small on that body compared to everything else. We got to have the framework to be able to put those kind of local observations into this broader context. Um, this is kind of a, a, an eye chart, but uh, the point here is that from the very beginning of um, planetary geologic mapping that started in earnest, which was for in support of Apollo, things have changed. Okay, we are not doing the same thing anymore. And to think that we are doing the same thing would be um, not responsible to the data and to the users. But this is just an example of how the correlation of map units, just one piece of the map, have changed through time and when things have changed. So this is all this is doing is recognizing that processes have changed. And if you see and start lining things up, the processes and the methods with which we're depicting geology are starting to change based on the bodies and the data that are coming back. So bodies, every body has different processes that are being active and they're expressing geologic processes in different ways. And there are changes that are happening to the geologic maps. I think that this is really important. So forget about the details. It's just saying that things are changing as we move along. The colors are corresponding to the different bodies of which um, are being mapped. So keep that in mind, put a pin in, and we're going to come back to it. So let's talk about the present. Um, so that was past. This is the present. We have 250 um, geologic maps or so from the USGS that are published at standardized scales, multiple scales from multiple bodies, terrestrial planets, satellites, multiple scales, multiple data sets. Um, these set the context for investigation and exploration. Um, they're international benchmark for planetary geologic maps. It's just setting a standard so that we can all be talking about the same thing. Um, and on the right-hand side is just one of the examples of a recent map. This is the Athabasca Vallis map um, that was published by uh, Laz Castell and our friend Alex Huff here. Um, and it's an excellent map. And it, was, it took a long time to put together and it establishes context. Is, is this, if you're not studying in this area on Athabasca, does this map matter to you? It's a good question. I think it does, because I think that you can apply representations of other places to the area that you're studying. And so I think it's important to say that I'm not interested in this one area, this map doesn't apply to me. It's how maps are prepared, what they're containing, what they're missing even, how they're wrong. This is the only way that we're gonna evolve and move forward and make these maps better products. Um, 
So that's the USGS maps. This is a map from uh, ASU's own Hannes Bernhardt. This is a journal published map of Hellas, and it includes map related documentation. There's no record of the occurrence or access points to a lot of the journal related maps. For USGS and some of the standard product, we have to get them out there. You can search in different areas. One thing that we as a community are missing is that we don't know where a lot of these geologic maps are for other bodies at other scales. What we need is to have some kind of inventory so that we can all leverage these. Otherwise, we're missing product and we are doomed to replicate um, different kinds of maps because we don't have access to them. These are critical pieces of data infrastructure. So let's talk about the future just a little bit. Um, this is a picture that was recently taken. I think it's a really cool picture that we were doing some tests up in Northern Arizona um, in advance of, so we were doing suit tests with two crewed astronauts um, at night to simulate the low lighting conditions of the, um, the lunar south pole. This is a picture, like a long exposure picture of those folks operating in the shadow as projected onto SB Crater. Um, this kind of thing is the future. This whole um, exercise was run by having a back room in Houston, having the flight controllers operating uh, with the science back room, and then talking to the folks in the field, um, having everybody observe what was going on to really do a test. This is the first of many tests that will happen as we start to put boots on the ground um, onto the lunar surface. What was really interesting is that one of our roles in this was to create the geologic maps, use those maps to create stations. Where do we want to go visit based on our understanding about where they're going to be? And how do you plan to traverse in between these sites? Really interesting work and a lot of fun. Um, but the future is also tied to the past, right? So some of those pictures that we were taking out there, if, if I'd stripped the color off and made them be black and white and put them right next to this one on the right hand side, it's the same thing. 60 years later, it's the same thing in the same area doing very, very similar things. We've lost some of the knowledge, right? Um, and it's because we have six, 50, 60 years of space in between the time that we sent people back. So we have to do some reinvestigation. We have to dig out some of these archives. We have to learn things again and train up our crew members so they have an understanding. Um, there's a lot of work for us to do, but there's inspiration there because here's Neil Armstrong riding a donkey in the Grand Canyon. Okay, that's great. Um, here are the folks as an ask, uh, the astronaut candidate class at Meteor Crater doing geologic mapping. And on the right hand side, they're doing suit tests on the Bonita flow, which is right outside of Sunset Crater, which is the area that burned this past year. So the future to me for geologic mapping is this kind of separation between fund fundamental science or what's also called basic science. And that's not to be deprecating to that science. It just means that it is foundational to what we're doing. So fundamental science and then applied science. Fundamental science is establishing um, context and expanding our current body of knowledge, is discovery and invention. What are the processes that are operating? What scales are they operating on? How old are these units? Which ones are the oldest and which ones are the youngest? Um, there's a lot that we just don't know and that requires just basic investigation so we have a better understanding about our place in the solar system. It's investigator driven um, and it's flexible in time scale. Okay, so investigator could be a body of people, it could be a, a mission, it could be something that is driving that, but it's certainly there to understand, better understand what's going on. What's getting ready to happen, and it'll be interesting to watch, is that we're moving into a place of applied science. That means that we need to know how to apply those maps that we make. Um, where are the hazards? Where are the illumination angles? What's the most rapid spot that they can get to What's the most rapid path back in case something happens? We're talking about people on the moon now, but it's not just the moon. It's us as a humanity moving forward into these other bodies. We need to have an understanding about what these products are and how we can use them to apply our science for the betterment of humanity. That's client driven. That's on a tight time scale. Apply what we already know. These two things play together. And this is where we're going, not with geologic mapping alone, but with all of the planetary sciences as we start to move off this world onto other worlds, which is happening right in front of our eyes. So the future is applied science, obtaining knowledge for practical application. And those kinds of things are, here's an artist's illustration of mining on the moon, mining for whatever you might want to mine for. Um, I don't know what exactly that one was supposed to be, but what we have here is landing zones, resources, and resources is things like aggregates, stuff to move around and build things with. Um, solar um, energy is it's a resource, water, ice, rare earth elements, um, helium, um, habit, habitability for the present and for, um, um, and for the past. So is there evidence of any kind of habitability on the moon or other bodies? 
livable spaces, caves, where do we know the, uh, where they are, how deep are they, where do they go, where do they come from, um, hazards, slope stability, um, surface stability, um, any kind of thing that might get in the way and cause harm to our investment, and most importantly, our people. And then land use. Eventually, we're going to get to a place where we need to have you know, land use, political boundaries, roads, different kinds of things. It's down the road, but this starts with understanding where we are in the context that's afforded by geologic mapping. So a couple of things here. Um, got another five minutes, not too many slides, but I wanted to point out that workforce planning, meaning that workforce planning sounds so boring, I need to find another way to say that. So what I'm talking about is moving forward as um, us people, as we are studying, especially to you geologists. Um, the Geological Society of America came out and put a position statement. This was about 20 years ago now, and they have reinvented it uh, every few years or so. The position statement says, there's a consensus view within the community of the importance of geologic mapping for natural resources and land use decision making. Also, we encourage partnerships among government, academia, and industry to share mapping expertise and technology, um, promote the development of digital data and maps in readily accessible and usable forms. If you have a ton of data, but you can't get at it, you're at the same problem of where I started with this. You know, there's no point in having data if nobody can get at it. We need to do a better job of making big data available to everybody who wants to use it in a, in a compatible format. And then encourage educational institutions like ASU, like NAU, um, and funding agencies to value and reward the teaching of geologic mapping skills. It's a holistic view to geology. You can't teach geology without teaching geologic mapping, okay? You can't teach geologic mapping without knowing geology. I'm not trying to be a purist about it. It's just how things are integrated together. And I do feel that that's an important part. Another um, element of workforce planning is there was a National Geologic Mapping Act in 1992. Nobody wants to hear about statutory numbers and all that kind of stuff. But what this did was it made the National Geologic Mapping Database. This is the database that you can go to and anybody can get access to pretty much any map that you want from a federal and a state level. This is the law that said we have to have one to 24,000 scale maps of every state for the contiguous United States. Um, that's awesome. That's great. It's been there and it's been um, re-upped multiple times. Congress finds that the production of geologic maps has been curtailed in the past 20 years. That the primary, that geologic maps are the primary base for applied and basic earth science applications. And that means, this is in order from what is cited in the, stat, uh, in the statute, mineral energy and water resources, waste disposal, land use evaluation, hazard reduction, civil infrastructure, roads, and um, you know, landing platforms, and anything that you can think of, and then at the very end of that list is basic earth science research. Everything is involved in here. And there's a law now that says that we have to do this as a collaboration between the federal government and the state and local governments to make these maps for every um, map and uh, for every state in the United States. This same kind of thing will eventually happen for other bodies because there will be a recognition that we have to do some of these things. I'm not talking about all of a sudden we need to go out there and start paving the moon, right? And I'm just saying that we need to be prepared so that we know where the resources are and we can do it in a responsible way. If we don't have a plan, then we're not going to be able to do it efficiently. We're not going to be able to do it in a way that is preserving those resources for ourselves and more importantly, for future generations. Our part in workforce training and, um, and bringing up the next kind of generation, we're not educators. Um, at the USGS. We do teach. Um, we take people out in the field and we've been doing some astronaut training. We've been working with our, our colleagues at the Johnson Space Center to bring them out there and have them understand what it means to um, design a spacesuit that will be getting over certain kinds of terrains. But we don't teach. We want to be able to integrate with uh, different institutions that are teaching to teach elements of this. And we've been starting to do that with um, Northern Arizona University. What we can do is to um, published techniques and methods papers, and we've been doing that more and more recently. So planetary geologic mapping protocol, how do you make geologic maps? Here are all the steps that we um, anticipate that you would be needing to do this. Um, and then also program status and future needs of the um, planetary geologic mapping program. What does the community need from geologic maps? Both USGS maps, um, standardized maps, and non-standardized maps. Um, we participate in review panels, specification documents have to go in before a um, proposal is put in to say that we can support something that wants to make a geologic map. Um, emphasize past products, looking through our archives and making sure that those things are available to people that want them. Let's learn the lessons from the past. One thing that's a problem here is that I don't want to get to a place where it's so canned with geologic mapping that 
we don't think outside the box, right? That we have to be thinking outside the box because there is no one method. So when we put out this protocol, people can pick up that protocol and read through it and think that I'll just apply this protocol to this one body with this new data set. And that's true, but you need to be thinking outside the box. And actually the problem here is not the box itself. The box needs to go away. We need to be thinking that there is no box and that we need to go beyond that. Let's just destroy the box, break the box and make a new one or have different kinds of cans of you know, procedures that we have for different bodies and different data sets. We need to recognize the past processes. We need to recognize the past products. Don't discount them and think that they're useless, but we also need to recognize and honor this geo-renaissance that's happening, the volume and diversity of data, uh, recognize the stakeholders, who needs these products. The astronauts that go to the moon are gonna need certain kinds of products. Researchers are gonna need another kind of product. The flight controllers who are planning the traverses will need even another kind of product. We need to recognize the range of stakeholders that need these products and answer to those and be um, sensitive to their needs. And we also need to create and start focusing on the difference between foundational and fundamental data products, as well as the side uh, applied science product. So geologic mapping for most discovery. Um, we can, geologic mapping promotes innovation. Um, and the next step that we have here is to get from the surface onto other bodies. And the moon is just the first step. Um, we have a lot of work to do as a community to get us there. Um, and I think that the geologic mapping community is up for this task and is ready to do this, but we need to be thinking about it in a holistic and kind of a different way. So with that, I will end there and happy to take any questions. So if there's any questions in the room, just wait for a microphone or raise your hand and we'll see when we go. There you go. I was just going to ask, how does the US current, how does the USGS currently uh, take geologic maps from kind of independent researchers and make them more available for the public? Yes, that's a really good question. So we don't currently have the capability. Our money is coming almost 100% from NASA. And so there's no mechanism for us currently to take maps that other people have made and turn them into USGS product. And that's a that's an issue, right? Um, not just for the USGS, but for the community at large, because many people are making really high quality maps that don't have the ability to publish them. Europeans in particular, they don't have a venue to publish those kinds of maps. And so we've been trying to work out um, those details about taking that. There's no plan in place right now, but we are certainly working on it. The only thing that I would encourage is if people have um, information like that is to Look for journal publications. The Journal of Maps is a great uh, place to, to publish those kinds of maps. They give it a technical review as well as a scientific review. And then to also reach out to us because things might change moving forward. Things are changing pretty rapidly. And we want to be able to, if we can't make a USGS scientific investigation map, a SIM series product, which is kind of the, these preeminent products, we certainly might be able to start taking data and hosting that data as a way to get that information out there. It's way more discoverable that way. So certainly be in touch and reach out because that might be something that's on the horizon. Um, so I had a similar question to that. Um, like the, um, for example, researchers who are working with um, rover data and uh, finding more um, uh, data that can help us um, like ground truth basically what we're, uh, we already have geologic maps for for some of the locations, then uh, how much time does it take to update those the standardized maps that USGS published with the new information? Right, that's also an excellent question, is that we would update the maps um, if requested by the author where possible. Um, often the authors have already expended the funds that were invested on that one product. And so that's where we get back to these products are a snapshot in time and that we want them to be that way. If people have a need to update or the funds to update, for sure, we would like to talk to people. I was just talking to um, colleague Dave Williams about updating um, the IO map, I believe, with some data that came in for the, the polar region. So those kinds of things we are certainly able to do and we would encourage. We don't have the funding to give to people to do that, but we would certainly be willing to work with anybody. Um, like I said before, that. I want to think outside the box on, on how to do these things. If there's things that we're missing as a community, we, USGS, might not have the money from NASA to do it right now, but we can take it to the appropriate folks that they can socialize it and we can start getting it as things that we need to be doing as a community. And then we can turn around and start having a plan. So anything like that, we certainly want to hear about it. It's a great question.
All right, Jim, this is a bit tangential, but you kind of piqued my curiosity about Gene Shoemaker. I realized I don't know what his history was before he got into all of this. So what was his, how did he come into that position to sort of be the advocate for this? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, I was recently reading a, a book um, to a Rocky moon by Don Wilhelm, who apparently is my favorite new author, but um, he, and he went through that whole, like the ramping up of investigations pre Apollo. I mean, starting with, you know, hundred years before that, but um, Gene came from, from terrestrial structural mapping. Um, and I think that he was working in, um, in Colorado for a while um, with the USGS. And so he kind of bounced around. And I think that he was given a, in that um, Mason and Hackman map, that initial map that was made of the moon, he was given an opportunity to kind of as a one-off to say, do, can you do anything with this? They're asking for this, can you do anything with it? And he took it from there and ran with it. Yep. And so it just kind of something that fell in his lap. Um, and it really worked because I think that they were looking for a reason to do something other than just plant a flag. And so do something that is inspirational and get this information back and, um, getting science returned is important. And also the maps, again, the maps are colorful and they're engaging. And so that was kind of the initial foray for them. And once they did it, once they started to recognize that it's so totally possible. And that's when they started on their campaigning. Yep. Jim, I have one question online here. It's, yep. um, first, it starts with a thank you very much. And then how will the political lines be determined? Yeah, okay. Um, and so added that in there as a way to say that this is something that will happen in the future. Um, I don't know anything about political lines. I'm not even suggesting that we will be in that place. That is way beyond my pay rate, and I'm not going to touch that with the template poll. But the point there is that those kinds of things have to be anticipated by people, again, above my pay grade. And we need to be thinking about that. Um, and from a ge that's a mapping standpoint and you know geopolitical boundaries on different bodies and those kinds of things. There are accords that we have signed as um, countries that we can lean on moving forward that everybody is entitled to some of these bodies and access to them from a scientific standpoint. Um, I don't know how those lines, those political lines will be drawn. That's not in my area of expertise. I can say how geologic contact lines will be drawn and we'll see how that kind of correlates to geopolitical boundaries. I have a question. Uh, what's the basis for determining the spatial resolution of sensors and mapping? Oh, can you repeat it? Uh, I mean, uh, what's the basis for the spatial resolution of sensors and uh, mapping? Oh, so the, the basis for spatial resolution of sensors, um, of instrument sensors? Yeah, instrument sensors and uh, the mapping results. Um, I'm sorry, I don't understand for the last part. How does, how do you determine the spatial resolution from the sensor and how does that influence the map product you make? Okay, um, that's a good question. So as far as sensor development and what the data, this is again, not my area of expertise. We're gonna take the data and we rely on the experts who are accumulating the data and building the instruments for that. But what I can say is that certain data is appropriate for certain scale, right? And so if you have something that is one meter per pixel, you would not use one meter per pixel to make a one to one million scale map you could, it's just going to take you years and years to do. And so there is a balance between the resolution of a map and um, the resolution of the data that you are bringing in. For example, CTX images for Mars, their optimal resolution are something like one to 20,000 or one to 24,000 scale. And that's six meters per pixel. Okay. Um, when we start talking about things that are very local, these kind of um, um, high rise type of like landing site images, those kinds of things that we would be using. We're talking about quarter meter to a half a meter to a meter. And those can afford, reasonably afford something that is on the scale of one to 10,000 scale, one to 15,000 scale. But it's a function of the scale of the map and the, the, the scale of the data set that you're looking at. And there's a little rule of thumb that we have. Anyone else? Awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for taking the time to be here, everybody. Um, I'm really excited about the, the things that we have going on and I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. For those of y'all in the room, I'd like to point out that there's a table of maps as you exit. Feel free to take 
a few of them. There are a few different types. 